In his book, The Reconfigured Eye, Visual Truth in the Post-Photographic Era, William Mitchell wrote, We can identify certain historical moments at which the sudden crystallization of a new technology, such as printing, photography, or computing, provides the nucleus for new forms of social and cultural practice and marks the beginnings of a new era of artistic exploration. The end of the 1830s, the moment of Daguerre and Fox Talbot was one of these, and the opening of the 1990s will be remembered as another, the time at which the computer process digital image began to supersede the image fixed on silver-based photographic emulsion. From the moment of its sesquicentennial in 1989, photography was dead, or, more precisely, radically and permanently displaced. The first Apple computer came out in 1984. Most households didn't have computers until the early 1990s. Photoshop 1.0 came out in 1990, and there was a start there into the foray into digital photography. First with Photoshop and now Lightroom and others, and in, in ever increasingly sophisticated digital camera systems, photography has been part of the digital revolution. We're all part of the infancy of this technologies. Cameras and printers came of age in the early 2000s, matching or surpassing what 35 millimeter film can do. Ultimately, the techniques of photography are about control, controlling lighting, color, tone, contrast. Cropping with a camera's viewfinder is about control, what you include or exclude from a photograph, or as Hank Wessel put, where to stand and when to take the picture. Photography also uses a controlled vantage point. It uses a one-point perspective of the camera lens. The early years of the 21st century saw widespread replacement of film for digital in both professional and amateur markets. There was one digital photographer, however, who made a significant body of work and really preceded the rest of us by easily a decade. I'm going to show her work as well as a few directions in contemporary digital photography at the end of this presentation. Nancy Burson is best known for her pioneering work in morphine technology. In 1968, she conceived of her age machine, an interactive computer that would allow viewers to see their faces aged in front of them. At the time, research in computer visualization was not far enough along for her to realize her project then. It would take the assistance of engineers at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology to help her refine the process using computer models to transform the appearance of the viewer into that of an older person. She did a series of these, including celebrities, such as Prince Charles and Princess Diana, who were aged, as you see in this example. Burson continued to collaborate with one of the two programmers who later became her husband. Together, they developed a computer program which gives the user the ability to age the human face. They have assisted the FBI and other law enforcement locating missing persons as a result of this. This started when Burson was contacted by an FBI agent who had seen her work. He wanted help with a missing child case. Eaton Patz, who was six years old when he was last seen in Soho in 1979, and in conjunction with the Patz family, in the FBI, she assisted in the case producing an age portrait of Eaton that was published on the front of the New York Post. Sadly and unfortunately, it did not result in his return, but Burson's aging software proved helpful in many other FBI and National Center for Missing and Exploited Children cases to locate kidnapped victims. You might have grown up with milk cartons with missing children printed on the side. 
this is a case when life imitates art, where an art project was produced and then it was adapted for these other uses. Michael Sand wrote, Starting in the early 1980s, Burson made a number of computer-generated composite portraits. The program created an average of several images fed into the computer by mapping facial coordinates and finding their mean, a process that laid the groundwork for the current mania in morphing. This beauty composite number one was equal parts made up of Betty Davis, Audrey Hepburn, Grace Kelly, Sophia Loren, and Marilyn Monroe. If you put all of those celebrities together and blended them, this is the face that you would come up with. In this composite, she used celebrities more contemporary for her time, Jane Fonda, Jacqueline Bissett, Diane Keaton, Brooke Shield, and Meryl Streep. This is equal parts, each one of those blended together, and this is what their face would look like. The works address and question our notations of beauty. Big Brother is a composite portrait of dictators. It's equal parts Hitler, Stalin, Mussolini, Mao, and Khomeini. Ironically, the resulting photograph looks very similar to Saddam Hussein who was dictator of Iraq. Her work's both playful and serious at the same time. Here you can see her warhead number one, 1982, which is 55% Ronald Reagan, 45% Russia's Brezhnev, and less than 1% of Thatcher from England, Mitterrand from France, and Deng from China. She used the percentages based on the size of each country's nuclear arsenal. If it looks a little more like Ronald Reagan, it's because the U.S. has the highest amount of nuclear bombs. Her take on what a president would look like by blending Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, Richard Nixon, Ronald Reagan, and George H.W. Bush. Her work takes on the issues of gender and identity as well. Here's a blending of six men and six women in her piece, Androgyny. One of her most famous photographs is this image, Mankind. Here she took the major ethnic populations in the world and blended examples of them together based on the current world population statistics. So in essence, if you blended everybody together in the world, we would look something like this person. She does have a playful streak. You see that in her piece, Businessman. Here are the composite images. So these are the 10 images of businessmen that she used. Here's the composite result. Burson created a human race machine that allows people to view themselves in a different race. It was featured on the Oprah Winfrey Show in 2006. The race machine toured U.S. college and universities as a diversity tool that provided students with a profound visual experience. The race machine is computer software that alters facial features and skin color to show how one would look if one were another race. Here's an example of that. human race machine takes your picture and shows what you would look like in six different races. It can truly turn curiosity into an education. You're just going to put your chin up over here and then look up at the screen. Okay. Should I move it all? No, you're good. Perfect. Okay, now I'm just going to map out your features. So Dave, what do you consider yourself? Like what race? Caucasian. Caucasian, so white, right? Yeah, white, white. Okay, so in this machine, what it's going to do, it's going to morph your face with the stereotypical features mm -hmm. of each of these races. But since race is like a socially constructed thing, there's no like genetics for it, it's just, it's just going to be like a stereotypical image. Okay. So Asian is the first one. <laughs> <laughs> so here, like your features are white and yeah, yeah. white and nose. 
your cheekbones also change, but then your lips stay exactly the same. I have big lips. Yeah, your features mm -hmm. with the stereotypical black image. Thanks. Huh. So it's weird. It looks different also. Yeah. Some of your features doesn't fit in with the stereotypical white image. As someone who's working the race machine, seeing people go through it has been really, really interesting. Because you can almost like see the questions form in their mind. I was surprised how similar they were. With the exception of some of them, the lips changed. But other than that, it looks a lot like how I look now. It can definitely be educational in that way because it's hard to get past the skin tone to see, oh, that person is a lot like me. Burson also works on large scale installations. Here you can see an example of one of her outdoor pieces arguing that there is no gene for race. But there was broad interest in Burson's work, as you see here. Her piece made the cover of Scientific America magazine in 2003. And 10 years after she started doing her photo composites, she was featured on the cover of Time magazine with one of her pieces of the image of an average American female. This piece was produced in collaboration with the staff at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. It blends the images of chimpanzee and a human being. It was conceived as an anthropological experiment. The work represents Burson's attempt to approximate an image of early humans. She has fun with the process as well, as you can see here, her picture of both predator and prey, the lion and the lamb, or a cat and dog, and then look at her title. Since this time, Burson's continued working on photography. She has done a number of interesting projects, particularly her portrait projects. Her work often bunks the trend in photography. Recent years, she's worked with Polaroid and other materials. But when you're looking at the serious work of early digital photographies, it pretty much begins with Nancy Burson. Digital photography today is widespread. Most photographers today work digitally. Some take the tool and use it as an extension of the darkroom, but others use it in ways that would have been more difficult to achieve in the darkroom. Well, Jerry Yulesman is a master at combination printing in the darkroom. Photoshop and other programs have given photographers the tool to blend images together in new and significant ways. Mark Klett and Byron Wolf have worked on a series of re-photographic projects where they took photographs made in the 1870s and then over a hundred years later re-photographed the scene. Working digitally, they can collage the antique photographs included with the contemporary photograph that you see here. The antique photographs here of William Bell, and then Klett and Wolf's photograph, essentially in the background. Here they're taking the same idea, but looking at many photographs made over a period of time from the same basic vantage point of the Grand Canyon. So you can see images made by Ansel Adams, Alvin Langdon Coburn, and the Detroit Publishing Company, which was likely William Henry Jackson. Another interesting approach to digital photography is this work of Michael Wolf, a SUI, a series of unfortunate events. And to skip to the chase, essentially what he does is he mines Google Maps. He spends hours and hours and hours looking at the camera on Google Map, you know, the little person that gives you and you can put them down on the street. He goes to street level and goes from place to place to place just trolling the streets. They are essentially, in a way, almost like surveillance photographs. He's for surveilling through a software program. He photographs the images directly from his computer screen. So he's photographing the surface of that screen. Sometimes they're kind of funny and delightful results like you see in this image. 
Other time they are events that seem more concerning. This might be more prevalent in some states than others. What is it that Diane Arbus said about photography? A photograph is like a secret. The more it tells you, the less you know. He finds some unusual events. More ways than one. And then something we've probably all witnessed at one point or another. Well, another interesting artist who's done a number of interesting projects throughout the years, who's also doing interesting digital work, is Mike Mandel. In earlier lectures, I've shown you a Mike Mandel piece or two. As a reminder, he's the one that did the baseball-like photographer's trading cards. They'd come tend to a package with a stick of gum for a dollar and looked like baseball cards, but had his favorite photographers. He also did this interesting, fun book, Seven Never Before Published Portraits of Edward Weston. At this point in the semester, you should know who Edward Weston is, an important mid 20th century photographer. Almost every photograph Weston made has been published and everything he's written has pretty much been published in terms of his diaries and letters and things like that. So finding seven never before published portraits of Edward Weston would be a big photo historical coup. Well, when you open the pages of this book, what you find is instead of the Edward Weston that we're expecting, what Mike Mandel did is he went around the country, and at, and at the time before cell phones, people used phone books, and he went around the country and looked up all the Edward Westons he could find. He sent them a letter and a copy of a questionnaire and asked if they would send a picture of themselves and return the questionnaire. The seven who responded became the seven never before published portraits of Edward Weston. It's just not the Weston we're thinking about. One of the things I like about Mandel's work is he's always challenging the context of how photographs are used. That's also the case in this book. I believe it was 1975 Evidence, which was a catalog of an exhibition at San Francisco Museum of Modern Art under the same title. Mike Mandel and Larry Sultan looked at close to a million photographs in both government and corporate files, and they took pictures from those files that were used as evidence of something, but removed the written context of what the photographs were about. So what you were left with were these photographs that without their original context don't explain a whole lot. They might ask more questions than they provide answers. And so in theory, what this book does is it, su it suggests that understanding photography is more about understanding the context in which a photograph is seen than the photograph in and of itself. Here's one of my favorites from that series. A group of people standing as far out as you can see in the landscape, which is a landscape of soap suds. What's going on here? I have no clue. Maybe you have a better idea than I why all these people in hard hats would wade out into this sea of foam. Not sure what's happening. But that's, in a way, the point of these photographs. That they rely on context to provide some understanding. Mandel and Sultan collaborated on other projects. They did a whole series of billboards. Here you can see a couple of quick examples of those works. So I wanted to get to Mandel's digital work. This is the first digital photo mural that he made. It's made out of ceramic tile. He put a proposal in for a call for public art on an Oakland City pool house. He ended up winning the commission and what he did is he went and photographed kids that were swimming and diving and jumping and using the pool, photographed them in black and white, digitized the images, and then 
one of the things you can do in Photoshop is you can limit the amount of tones or colors in a particular image. So he took the black and white image and limited it to 10 colors, shades of gray from black to white. So he took those 10 colors and then hired a ceramics company to make one inch tiles based on those 10 shades of gray from black to white. He then took the digital image and essentially used that as a map to create the tile. So every time there's a digit, he would put a one inch tile next pixel, one inch tile, and so on, and construct these images through the tiles. So from afar, they look like photographs. As you get up close, you would see they're made out of one inch tiles, etc. He's now doing these all over the country. He's made quite a splash in, in the public art arena. He's had major commissions, this is a fairly straightforward mural, as you see on an equestrian building here, where he's digitized an image of a rider and horse, and then reproduced that image using both ceramic and now enamel tile as well. This is not my image, but it's a piece that I encountered not too many years ago in the San Diego airport. He took photographs of people on airplanes, blended them together in Photoshop, and then again took the digital image and recreated that using ceramic tiles. As you get up close on it, you realize that it's a mosaic of tiles, but from afar they look like photographs. Just to give you a scale of some of the works. But I thought an interesting blending of technologies of digital photography, in a more antique process of ceramics, glass, and mosaicing. This is the last lecture out of 30. I appreciate your attention during these many hours listening to me talk about photography. Well, I hope you've got something out of this course. I enjoy doing the lectures. It's my first time around speaking into the computer screen rather than to an audience and so that took a little bit of adjusting probably for you as well but we've looked at a lot of photographs hopefully you've seen some things that piqued your interest if you weren't interested in it before so long <laughs>